The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and Podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Wrigley. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Michael back today. Michael, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me, James. Uh, it is nice to finally have a conversation with you. But as yeah. I said, I've seen so many of your videos online. I feel like I know you, which is kind <laughs> of the power of video, right? Yeah, and it's always kind of right back at you, as I was saying before we press record, that uh, I'm, I'm just looking forward to an opportunity to get to know you. You, you, you mentioned that you've, you've done a few of the Ensemble or XY podcasts in the past, but I see your face come up on different posts, different award ceremonies in the financial planning space that you're attending and, and, and so forth. So, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to just kind of get to know you and your business and where you're at and how you got to here and all of those fun things, and we'll just see where the conversation takes us. Sounds great. Looking forward to it, James. Uh, so... Your business human to human, let's let's maybe just talk about what you're doing at the moment and who you're doing that for or with. Now, if you want to say that, phrase that, and uh, and then maybe we'll go back a bit to how you got to where you're at. So, so, so talk us through human to human. What, what, what's your business? What are you up to? Yeah, so human to human is a coaching and consulting business. Uh, essentially, we help financial advice businesses solve people problems, which uh, is a pretty you know vague, um, generic statement, but- um, I have a psychological background, but I also have a, a business background. So I think this business is really the perfect melting pot of both of those things. Um, and really what we do is just help businesses better connect with the people outside their business, whether that be their market, uh, the people inside their business, uh, especially their team, but also their clients. And so the areas we tend to help with are marketing, the client experience, um, and also uh, empowering upcoming, uh, up-and-coming leaders within advice businesses as well. Yeah, nice, nice. And and how long have you been operating for? So, Human to Human launched at the end of 2016. Uh, yeah. I've been a business coach since 2013. So, no, didn't realize that till now. 10 year anniversary <laughs> this year uh, yeah. of working inside financial advice businesses. But I did come from financial advice land before that. So, I've actually been in the industry since pretty much since I left university in 2007. So, I'm like a career long financial advice industry guy. <laughs> yeah. So there's a few there's a few people that are like that that uh, inadvertently find their way into financial advice and then and then stay. So so it's a business consult business consulting um a uh, business that, that, that you operate that is that you've kind of always been in that financial advice space. What what's your path like to you know to to operating and opening your own business which is a fair while ago now 2016. So you've been doing it for for a while in your own business but how did you get to that point of your own business and and what's the what's the few years prior like for you yeah so i mean i think i probably had this degree of blind optimism like i think a lot of young people do you know i was in my early 20s uh, last year of university decided to you know, join a grad program which is what everyone was doing and you know threw my threw my hat in the ring in a bunch of corporates and big banks and i landed a spot uh, on the grad program at westpac I had a bunch of kind of internal product roles and, yeah, you go through rotation. So, they put you in different parts of the bank and uh, the idea is that you find one team that they like you and you like them and then you go work there permanently. Hmm. Um, I really liked the three experiences, but what it made me realize is that everything was far too behind the scenes and I really wanted to be at the coalface dealing with the people. 
Um, I, I had a couple of weeks, which they make everyone do on the Westpac Grab program, or at least they did back then, uh, where you go into a branch. And they were my very favorite uh, weeks of the program because you're out there with the people, building relationships, having conversations. So yeah, even though I didn't necessarily find that groove on the program, uh, I it, it gave me some clues as to the types of things I wanted to do. And what that meant was at the end of the grab program, I moved into the financial advice arm of Westpac. Uh, and eventually left Westpac to go do that in a small business. But um, I think it was at that point, you know, I, I decided I wanted to be a financial advisor. So um, I'd done the kind of, you know, cold calling, um, client relationship side of things. I then went, well, you know, I probably need to be the technical knowledge. So I became a para planner. And uh, that was actually, and to all those para planners out there, I have such an enormous amount of respect for you. I can absolutely understand what you do and I know what it's like. And um, to be honest, it just wasn't the right fit for my skills. Um, and that was really the the moment where I, I went, you know what, like I, I know exactly what I don't want to do. But then I was at a bit of a crossroads. I didn't really know what I did want to do. I just knew that um, it was in the industry, but it wasn't necessarily the, the roads that I'd been down prior to that. Yeah, right. So how did you end up, you know, getting out of the more of the kind of the the financial advice space, whether in the advising or power planning role, to to more of a consulting role. How how did you how did that happen? Yeah, so I suppose I I I knew that I loved the people side of our industry, um, but then there was this other like little nagging voice in the back of my head that was looking at the business I was working in, uh, which was a fantastic business, growing really quickly incredible people. Uh, but I could just see all these things that they weren't doing. And it was almost like I could see their potential. But that was just this kind of like little voice in the back of my head. I was like, okay, I can see that this this business can be better. But I, I you know, as a power planner, didn't really have the opportunity or or um, permission to, to kind of you know, vocalize those things that I saw or, or be involved in solving some of those problems. But the the actual turning point, and and I've I've actually returned back to this guy to thank him for this. But there was a so we were licensed through a, uh, it was AXA at the time, um, yep. and then became AMP. And there was this dude who came into the business to run training on neuro linguistic programming, and really the idea was how to you know in a very ethical and positive way um, speak the the language that your clients would understand and empathize with them and build connection with them based on the type of person that they were. And I think my boss um, at the time realized that I probably wasn't going to be a para planner, uh, but he did think I was going to be an advisor, as, as did I at the time. Uh, and he said, oh, look, you know, we're running this training for all the advisors. Why don't you sit in? And the guy's name was Neil Gomesall, and it literally blew my mind. Yeah, I sat in there for two days, but I realized that in my limited view, I thought, okay, well, there's... You know, essentially four roles you can do in the financial advice industry. You could be admin, power planner, uh, client relationship, or advisor. I didn't realize that there were these fringe roles in the industry where it was all about how do advisors do what they do better um, mm. or how do businesses uh, you know, reach their potential and um, operate at a higher level and, and you know, sharpen their tools. And I think that was the real turning point for me where I realized that if there was a problem inside a business, I had the opportunity to solve it. Um, and yeah, it did take a bit of braveness, but I just went to my boss and I said, I'm really not happy being a power planner. Um, this isn't really what I want to do. And although I'm not 100% sure what I want to do, what I can tell you is that digital marketing is you know, the way of the future. Uh, we're not doing any marketing and I'd love permission to you know, not completely change my role, but just to work on a few projects in this business to yeah, get all our advisors on LinkedIn to upgrade our website to start playing around with video, and uh, thankfully they gave me that opportunity. Oh, fantastic! And um, yeah, which is yeah, it it was so cool. So it, it was yeah, I was you know, working in my free time and trying to squeeze it in between SOAs, uh, but eventually that that role expanded and expanded, and and I was very fortunate that they they gave me the role of digital marketing manager. Yeah. Um, I worked alongside someone who you might know in the industry, Sophie Firminger, who now works for NetWealth. Yeah, okay. And uh, the two of us were, were essentially the marketing team for, for PSK. And uh, yeah, we, we, did, we did a lot of really cool things, but that was really the, the turning point for me. It was the start of 
I suppose a couple of things. Firstly, me finding a groove in the industry that really fulfilled me and brought out the best of my my skills and my strengths. But yeah, I think it was also the start of um, you know the, me seeing the opportunities that financial advice businesses had, and then you know when I helped one business with it, I just wanted to help more businesses with it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And then so you went and did your own, and, and it, I saw a, a post that you put on LinkedIn that a little while back that that Ben Nash and Pivot were your first client when you when you started your own business. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there was actually yeah. a bit of a, a – there was a step between that. So yeah. I um, was at an event in 2012. Uh, I'd, I kind of just started to – you know, I'd done, done the marketing role for a few years, um, but I, you know, I, I felt a little bit restless. I could see that there was an opportunity for me to leave my comfort zone and try something new. Um, and that was uh, at a time when um, you know, digital marketing really was entering the financial advice conversation. Uh, I saw Baz Gardner present at an AMP event, and uh, I was just blown away by what he said. I could just see that the ideas that he had for the industry at that time were not just revolutionary, but they were the exact right things for advisors to do. Yeah. Um, so I reached out to Baz. I ended up uh, working for him uh, for free in my spare time. And you know, to cut a long story short, he created an opportunity for me to come up, help launch the first Advisor Edge event, um, yeah. and that became the start of the social advisor. So I moved my life from Sydney to Queensland. Uh, we had a few really cool years together growing the social advisor. And yeah, and it was 2016 when when I moved on from the social advisor and then started Human to Human. Yeah, right. This, this is uh, two weeks in a row on the podcast that Baz's name has, has come up. He uh, keeps a little bit of a lower profile these days than than what he once did doing the, all the social advisor stuff. Yeah. But uh, certainly well and truly still involved financial advice industry there, oh, there you go yeah and i mean i think the the bit that um you know what when when i reflect on that journey you know the the reason that i i just listened to what baz was saying particularly around video for advisors and just jumped on it so quickly is i saw how advisors um were feeling so yeah icky about video but you know really what what he was talking about in terms of how advisors should be using video um, is exactly how they're using it today. So I think in a lot of ways, Baz was really ahead of his time. And you know, I see the same people who were uh, criticizing the the idea of using video at, as a client servicing tool back then and saying, oh, we're not bloody news readers and things like that. They're the same <laughs> ones who jump on LinkedIn in, in May and, and record a video to um, talk about budget announcements. So yeah, I think uh, it was it was a really wonderful part of my career. And it was also um, so fun to be part of a genuinely disruptive business that that really, you know, I look at where the industry is at now and I, I think a lot of the adoption of digital tools across businesses uh, probably wouldn't be where it's at if it wasn't for the social advisor. So it was, um, no, yeah, absolutely. It was a hell of a lot of fun being part of that that adventure. Absolutely. So let, let, let's maybe talk a bit more about so what, what you're doing at the moment. And, and so when I asked you about kind of human to human, you, you listed a, you know, a range of different areas where you tend to help businesses with mm. maybe we can spend a bit of time talking about each of those different areas and and maybe give anyone that might be listening some some tips and things that they can maybe do in their own business so because I, I i wrote down a question for you and this idea of where do you see financial planning businesses getting stuck mm. and, and that could be in their people could be in their marketing i'm sure different businesses are getting stuck in different places mm. But maybe could we we work through those different kind of elements, or however you might describe it, of of where you might engage with the business, and then where you find they're getting stuck, and then uh, how how can, how can we help them move past that? Yeah, so I think you know that the idea of being stuck is really interesting because I think sometimes business coaching or consulting can um, can come from a place of this business has no idea, and we're going to stand on a mountain and be the guru and you're going to listen to our ideas and, and you're going to learn from us. Yep. If you're talking about being stuck, the main place that I see businesses and certainly our clients being stuck isn't that they are sitting there scratching their head with no ideas. It's actually that they have too many ideas Gee, yeah, and gosh. don't know which ones to prioritize or they'll go to say, you know, an ensemble or licensee PD day or if they're part of a licensee, a licensee PD day and they'll hear a bunch of ideas and it, it adds to this list of these things that we we could be doing or that we should be doing, um, but 
you know, it, I read a book once um, and the name of the book escapes me. It's called Essentialism, just came into my head. Yeah. Um, and it talked about the idea that priorities um, with the plural at the end uh, had never been a word that was documented in the English language until the 70s. So until then, the, the word priority meant sole focus without competition. But all of a sudden, we decided in the 70s that we can have more than one sole focus, which, you know, as you can tell, it really <laughs> de it's defeats, it, word, it, 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 it completely contradicts the definition of priority. And so I think what I see inside financial advice businesses is this list of things that we could or should be doing grow longer and longer and longer. And what they really need is a way to engage in a conversation that the right ideas rise to the surface, that they have focus, that they have a more specific plan for, okay, well, we could do all of these things, but right now this is the thing that we should be doing. Um, but a lot of the time, the work that we do isn't necessarily saying, well, here's all these things you haven't thought about. It's saying, well, you've thought about a lot of these things, but let's actually work out what's most important to you and let's work out what's the right idea for right now um, and involve the team in that conversation as well. So, you know, in, in essence, what I'm describing here is something that a lot of the listeners would be very familiar with, which is goals-based advice. It's, it's pretty much goals-based consulting for financial advisors. Um, and a lot of the time, just having that conversation and giving people permission to rule a line through certain things on there, should we do that list and just decide exactly what they should be doing, is the most empowering part of what we do. Yeah, it's funny you say that, isn't it? I often, that there's, there's different elements of, of, of the of the operations of the business here that, that I work in, and 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 you think like day in day out, I'm 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 talking to clients about well, what is it you want to do, mm. okay, and then how do we how do we line up use of time and resources and whatever else it might be to to help you do the things that you want to do, yes. But then us as financial advisors, we forget to just translate that approach to some other project that we might be doing in the business or the development plans for our staff. Yes. Rather than saying, okay, well, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Associate Advisor or Power Planner or whatever role you might have, what is it you actually want to do? You might be doing that job at the moment, but what do you really want to do? Okay, well, then how do we help you get there? It's it's like the finan it's, it is the financial planning process that yes. most people would be following. But for some reason, we throw it out the window or, or we completely forget about it when we're trying to solve these other problems that we might be dealing with within the business. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And, you know, it's interesting because, and I, I think every client-facing professional would have this same, um, you know, experience, but you, you kind of go into business going, here's the value that I'm going to add to your business. And then the, the further you go in, in your career, you, you understand and appreciate different parts of what the value is of what you do that you never really realized. Um, and one of those for me is, you know, we'd get to the end of a one or two day business planning process with, with a business and um, the energy level of the, 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 you know, leadership team or the CEO was just off the charts. And they'd all consistently say the same thing saying, it's just so nice to actually sit and pause and not be distracted by the business and just to focus on what I want. And, yeah, that was the bit that surprised me. I thought that the the quality of strategy that came out of that day was the value, but actually just having that experience to push pause, yeah, before you even start talking is part of the value as well. And I think, you know, in every single area of our life, there's so much value in just pushing pause and, you know, stepping outside of ourselves and reflecting on what we're doing and, you know, trying to work out, is this on the right track or do we need to improve the way we're doing things? And yeah, yeah just having that genuine moment of reflection yeah, to take it back to financial advice, a review meeting. Yep. So how do you? So what is your? So what is your maybe your process look like? So I give you a call, find you on the website, and say, "Hey, Michael, we need some help here. We're we've got this this list of you know, as you as you put it before. Maybe it's there's too many things mm. that we wanted that we want to do, rather than we don't know what to do. Yeah. How do, how does it, the 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 engagement process work with you? What what happens? Yeah, so I suppose there's there's two distinct paths that 
we will go down when someone reaches out or when we speak to someone for the first time. One is that they know what they want. So yeah, as an example, I recently had a business engage saying, right, we are principals who've been doing all the you know advice and selling in the business and we now want to step out of that and empower our team. And so we need your help to build a clearer sales process. So that's you know, one particular path where it's like, okay, we know exactly what we want and, and then it's a case of working out if we're the right fit. Yeah, There are people in the other camp, though, who like our ideas. Um, they like what we're about. They might have spoken to a business who've worked with us. But um, yeah, as you alluded to, they really don't know where to start or what, what they should be focusing on. Um, the first step in that for us sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually not to limit the ideas too quickly. Uh, often we're pretty conscious of the fact that we might be engaging with someone at the you know see at a very senior level or the founder or the CEO level. Um, their perspective is really important, uh, but I would say just as important and sometimes more important is the perspective of the team. So yep. before we'll even get to a point of triaging what the project looks like, um, firstly because we need the team support for whatever we do, but secondly there are perspectives and ideas in the team that aren't normally coming to the surface and we need to create a way for them to come to the surface. So before we start anything in terms of working together, we'll find out where the team sees things and try and find the trends and the commonalities. Um, The additional voice in that as well is actually understanding how the clients feel about things. And particularly if someone is having, say, um, a retention issue or potentially, you know, a conversion issue, it would be remiss of us to try and solve that problem without actually understanding things from the client's point of view. So you know, to answer your question, it, it varies business to business, but um, it would be a combination of how do the team see things? Um, how do, you know, the CEO, founder, leadership team see things? How do the clients see things? Um, and then we put our own lens on it as well. So it would be really common for us if we felt that there was a client experience problem to review every element of the client experience. We want meeting recordings. We want to read, you know, the emails that go out in between. We want to understand in in real clarity that exact client experience so we can do a proper diagnosis. Yeah, right. Okay. And and how like how long would you typically be working with a business for? Is it is it some type of ongoing engagement for some people? Is it more of a one-off project basis for, for others? Like how, how does that look for you? Yeah, it really depends. Um the majority of our work would be very long-term client relationships. So, you know, if you think about um, that that idea of, you know, pushing pause every, say, 90 days, working out where a business is at, creating a clear plan for the next 90 days that engages the team, uh, that work is never done. So, if I'm being honest, one of the most surprising things about the, how the business has transpired is you know, a lot of our clients we've been working with for four, five, um, you know, one in particular we've been working with for six years. So we do have, yeah, that, that, I suppose the core of the business is those longer term client engagements. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it, a lot of that becomes new level, new devil. Um, you know, the conversations we were having uh, in year one or two are dramatically different than the ones we're having today. But um, at the end of the day, if we believe that uh, that the wisdom exists within the business and they just need a, a methodical process to go through to tap into that wisdom to empower the team to um, engage leaders and, and to make them better and to to really create that alignment across the team towards a shared vision of success and then most importantly to to execute that um, that that work's never done um, you know it, even with something like a client experience we can take it from a good client experience to a, a magnificent client experience but that then becomes the client's expectation. And a year or two later, it doesn't feel that magnificent anymore. Yeah. There's new tools and there's new technology and there's new problems and there's new approaches. And yeah, there is uh, there is this ongoing nature to what we do that I suppose when you reflect on it, it makes sense that these are long-term, you know, almost, um, you know, we become part of the team after a while. Mm, um, absolutely. But, you know, there are also very specific situations where people need yeah, a, a, a thing and beyond that, that they're feeling pretty on top of things. And, and yeah, we'd love to help out there as well. One, what, one particular area that I'm uh, selfishly interested in, just given that the, the time of year and the, and the process that we're going through here is around uh, staff development plans. Mm. So, so it, it often gets spoken about that, you know, support your team and have development plans, but what, what is a development plan and, and what, what do you think m- makes for a, a, 
a good development plan that's it, actually helpful ra- rather than just putting words on a page or whatever. Like, ha- how should how should I, how should anyone listening go about facilitating a staff development plan session program? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, firstly, just the fact you're asking that question is a really good sign because I think there can become a bit of complacency in a lot of businesses where, you know, well, I sit near you every day. I kind of know how you're going. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, if you keep showing up to work and we're paying you, you know, we're kind of fulfilling our obligation. So, you'd be surprised how few businesses out there are actually thinking along those lines. What I would say are the ingredients for uh, you know, the difference between ticking the box of doing a staff development plan and having one that actually makes a difference um, is the posture. So I think if this is something that you're forcing on your team and they just feel like they're going along for the ride, but they're not really bought into it, it will never work. So um, it needs to become the team member's development plan. It can't become yours as the, the leader or the boss. The other thing that I, I see with that, so I, I think firstly, um, what does that mean? Well, that means uh, when you're going into that chat, make them do a little bit of pre-work, make them do a little bit of reflection, make them um, sit down and pause and actually reflect on what they want and the direction that they want to head. Um, one of the businesses that we've worked with over the years, um, Verse Wealth, um, ask a question before every um, you know, teammate one-on-one, which is, if you were to leave our business tomorrow, what would the reason be? No, um, and I, like I, I just love that question so much. And I think why I love it is it really destigmatizes the conversation about, you know, we expect you to be here forever or, you know, your preferences and your goals and your life changes. And rather than it becoming this big shock when someone resigns and you go, wow, I didn't see that coming, it means that there is this opportunity for people to, you know, again, it's when I said the posture, it's like, is the posture that the the business is is driving all the momentum of this and the, the teammates just going along to the meeting for the ride? Or are they owning their career and taking control of their career and deciding that this is mine and I can do whatever I want with it? Yeah. And a question like that really does force a team member to be more transparent in how they're feeling. And if there are little issues, it's much better to discuss them openly than to wait before it's too late. And, you know, that classic situation where someone resigns and, and, and the leader going, gosh, I just wish... I'd known that earlier. Or yeah, exactly. I, I, that, yeah, that, I, that's exactly what's going through my head as you're saying it. Like, we do we do exit interviews when someone leaves, and and you know, from time to time, there's people that leave. You're like, I I really wish that person didn't leave. But yes. then there's, there's some some things that come out in that in that exit interview. Like, oh, if only I had have just known that bit, we could have done something about it be- beforehand. Yeah, and that that question's fantastic. Yeah, uh, but but you know, if you think about most people's lives, like having difficult conversations would be yeah. If if you if you're feeling nervous about uh, yeah, like I suppose that that there is a a theory that the quality of your life is dictated by the amount of difficult conversations you're willing to have. But what I would say is this idea of struggling to bring up an uncomfortable truth with your boss isn't a problem with the team member, and it's not a problem with your culture or you as a boss. It's just a human challenge to actually have that moment where you tap your boss on the shoulder and say something that they may not want to hear, Um, particularly when it's attached to people's livelihood and their income and their their sense of, you know, ticking the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy that the stakes feel really high and it can be a really, really tough thing for someone to do. So I suppose when you think about a question like that, it really makes it easier for people to have these open conversations. Um, In some respects, it It forces them to, but it does it in a really constructive way where as the leader, if you then back up the answer to that question and don't just dismiss what they're saying, but actually engage in the conversation and maybe adjust a few things or, um, you know, maybe have the conversation go, okay, well, you know, like given what you're saying, I don't think there's anything we could do to keep you, but we understand that. And at least we're not, you know, thinking of you as a 10 year employee when what you've answered in that question makes me think we'll be lucky to get six months out of you. So um, I do think that just creating that openness where firstly the team member is owning their career and realizing that no one's going to carve their path through the business they need to decide what that is and and be active not passive in that process but also having these really open conversations in the business and at any one point in time kind of knowing exactly where someone's at um, and realizing that some people find that easier than others uh, but 
for the people who find it more challenging, just yeah, doing the best you can to create that open openness in your culture where they are sharing how they feel and you're sharing how you feel and doing that regularly. Um, yeah, it, it definitely improves the culture within a business. Uh, but it also, it usually means that, that your team members have the best chance of growing as well. Yeah, fantastic. I like it. We're uh, picking up some stuff here. I'm going to listen back to this episode. <laughs> I don't often listen back to my own episodes, but I'm going <laughs> to listen back to, to that bit there, which kind of lead, leads me into the, the, the kind of the, the, the last bit of the conversation that I wanted to have with you, which is around this kind of career development and so forth. So you, you're going to program, you could realize, is that what you call it? So you've, you, you've launched it program or new service or something that's coming up in September. So this episode will hopefully be live towards the end of August. But you want to talk us through what what you've got in the works? Yeah. So yeah, I, I mentioned that a lot of the the businesses and you know Pivot being a great example that when we started with them it was Ben and his wife and we were sitting in their in their dining room doing business planning and you know now now they're the they're the industry leaders and tastemakers that they are. Um, but as as a lot of the the businesses we've worked with have evolved, what we've noticed is you know they they kind of set things up right from the start or you know that they've that they're in that upper echelon of businesses who are doing things well. And as the supply of the industry has shrunk and the demand has grown, these businesses have really grown quite quickly. And obviously that is a great thing, but it creates its own challenges as well. And, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we're seeing across the industry are, uh, you know, system and process and the, the whole back office piece. But another one that we've seen and been quite intimately connected with is, um, yeah, the, the at, in in the beginning, the the CEO or the founder can just kind of shoulder all the burden for growth and improvement and making things happen. But as a business grows, you need to bring in more structure, and usually that means either hiring or empowering people in your team to become leaders. Uh, we've worked really closely with a lot of people in these businesses who you know might have started out as you know part time associate advisor, part time ops manager, and all of a sudden they're a general manager. Um, or, you know, even people who are just in that admin role and they're kind of similar to me when I was in financial advice land that they go, actually, I don't know if I want to be this, go down this advice path. I want to go down more of a leadership path. Um, and I feel like um, it's probably a combination of uh, because things are so busy, the the leaders and senior people within a business aren't able to train and mentor and empower these people as much as they'd like to. Um, another interesting trend we're seeing is that um, you know, the, the people who are, you know, in the best position to mentor and, and to be that, um, that, that person that someone can learn from, you know, through osmosis, because people are working remotely, um, they're not getting as much direct exposure to other leaders in the business and other people mm. who they can go, oh, that's how you run that type of meeting. Oh, that's yeah. how you explain that concept to the team. And so some of that natural, like, I'll just see how you do things and 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 learn how to be a leader that way has disappeared as well. So we've seen a, a, a huge gap inside a lot of businesses we work in, in terms of this person has all the potential in the world. They have a wonderful opportunity to become a great leader, but um, they're either struggling with a little bit of confidence, they're struggling with some of the skills, particularly those interpersonal skills, those influence skills, those change management skills to be a leader. Um, and they also need a bit of a perspective shift around how they spend their time. So um, I think when you're in more of a back office um, operational role, um, you feel like the busier you are, the better a job you're doing. But a lot of that's very reactive. And when you enter a leadership role, um, if you're just focusing on reactive stuff, you're actually probably not delivering on important projects. You're probably not making the change happen in your business that you need. And you need to actually flip your your brain a little bit and and find space to work on the business, not just in the business. And so these are challenges that we'd seen pop up time and time again. And we we're working very closely with uh, up and coming leaders within advice businesses. Um, and a couple of months ago, we decided, well, yeah, we're seeing this problem pop up more and more. So why don't we actually formalize the way that we help businesses in the advice industry with this? And that's what the Realize program is. It's a 12-week program to um, take a, a small group of up-and-coming leaders inside advice businesses and give them the tools and support and accountability they need to to realize their potential. Nice. And so what, what is the program, like what does the engagement through the program look like? Is it like a weekly thing? Is it a fortnightly thing? What, so, so, it's, so it's over 12 weeks, but what for anyone that might be interested or register, what, what type of 
How's the program structured? This is the point that I'm trying to get to. Yeah. So, there's three pillars um, and each of those represents uh, four weeks of the program. So, one of the pillars is confidence. Uh, This is the bit that I think a lot of up and coming leaders think that they, you know, there's a bit of imposter syndrome. They think that the struggle that they're having, not feeling like they have what it takes to do the role is unique. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to have a, a, a coach who said that most people think that their talents are common and their struggles are unique and it's usually the opposite. And <laughs> I see this in a lot of up and coming leaders that we work with. Um, and so really focusing on people understanding the type of leader they want to be, what their strengths are, um, and most importantly, realizing that they do have weaknesses and that's okay. And to not pretend that they don't exist, but to own them and feel empowered enough to um, vocalize those to to their manager and say, these are the things I need support with, um, is the critical starting point. Um, if you give people all the tools in the world to be a better leader, but they feel like they don't deserve to be there or they feel like they don't have what it takes, um, none of it will work. So that's, that's the first focus of the program. Second one is around time and space and Um, helping the leaders think more like business owners, think more strategically, um, create a clearer plan for what they want to achieve and and to take better control of their time, uh, whether that be how they spend each week or or what their focus is for a quarter. So bringing a lot more of that business planning uh, methodology into the way that a leader thinks about their role um, and also the way that they work with their team. Uh, The third pillar is momentum. So this is really about how do you engage the people around you? Um, I think there's... Yeah, you know, a lot of people have this default assumption that you can't train soft skills, like you're either born with them or you're not. Uh, and we've found that that's absolutely not the case. So uh, we want to bring some really clear tools and process to, to leaders to help them realize that you can get better at positioning ideas. You can get better at getting your team excited by change and getting them to support what you're trying to achieve, not working against you. Um, and to just, you know, things like having difficult conversations to realize that there's a way that you can think about that conversation and a way you can engage with that conversation where it's not as difficult as you think. So these are the three pillars. Um, we have fortnightly workshops where we're giving people the tools and the, um, I, I suppose, the, the knowledge and the intel to, to upgrade how they think about each of these things. Um, in between that, there's going to be live Q&A sessions. But the real value of the program for me is less about the things that I will be saying on a webinar. And it's actually the fact that everyone will leave one of the workshops with a particular personal challenge that's going to take them outside their comfort zone and take what we've talked about and apply it to something that's a very real problem in their business. So I suppose if this is a program that someone wants to come along to and you know fill their notebook and get some good ideas and then and then not change how they act... It's probably not the right program yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I just recently finished a, an experience with a with a business coach, and I can tell you, like the the three things that gave me the most value were moments where I actually had to leave that session and do something very specific that was painful and challenging and way outside my comfort zone. Uh, but that's where all the growth happens. So. Um, People are really signing up for 12 weeks of leaving their comfort zone in the safest, most supportive environment possible uh, and also being surrounded by people who are just like them. I think um, what, you know, this is something I experienced as a power planner was, yeah, you you can sometimes feel like you're battling it all on your own. And it was only in those environments where, say, AXA or AMP would put me with other power planners that you share notes and see how they're doing things and, you know, you see that they're struggling with the same things as you, which feels really empowering because you go, oh, it's not just me. Um, but you're also seeing different ways of doing things and, and learning from people who are just like you and, and learning from example rather than just theory. So being in an environment of people similar to you who are trying to achieve similar things and comparing notes and, you know, almost using them as a benchmark too for, for you know, setting the, setting the barometer for where you should be in your role higher um, is a really, really empowering thing as well. So I think that group group uh, environment is going to be super, super conducive to change for a lot of these clients as well. And how many people are you hoping to have along for the for the group for the twelve weeks? What are you? We're capping. Are you aiming for? We're capping. capping so yeah. th- this is our first intake kicking off yep. in September. We're capping the group size at twelve. Okay. Um, we think that's the right amount of people to have a good conversation um, for there to be accountability. So it's kind of, yeah, people can't necessarily shrink into the background, but yeah, exactly. there is a conversation, but you can start to get to know people and build connection as well. So yeah, that's why we're capping groups at 12. Yeah. Nice. And so where can people find out more about 
the the program or register if you're interested and just generally human to human like you yeah, you know your website and stuff a bit of a plug we'll put some links into the to the show notes wherever you might be listening this listening to this from but yeah where where can people find out a bit more yeah so uh, if you want to find out about the realize program just go to human to human and that's to spell T-O, so human, T-O, human.com.au forward slash realize. If you want to connect with me personally, very active on LinkedIn, uh, have a lot of uh, wonderful conversations on there. So yeah, find me on LinkedIn, Michael Back. I think my handle is Michael J Back. Uh, and yeah, I love uh, I love expanding my network and, and uh, getting to know people on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Michael. Appreciate you coming along and joining me for a for a podcast you've you've been on Ensemble or XY podcast a few times before. Appreciate you coming back again. Uh, a bit of a uh, fair, fair bit of golden knowledge in there for me. As I said, there's sections of this I'm going to listen back to. So hopefully others uh, get just as much from it as well. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much, James. Really enjoyed the chat. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.